Cool. Um, thanks for the invitation. So, um, as you've probably noticed, at least over the last few days, um, artificial neural network re methods represent the state of the art on many, probably most major <coughs> applied language understanding tasks in NLP. Things like translation or question answering, at least in the sort of squad, answering over text style. <coughs> um, the question that I've been interested in, um, in over the last few years is, can neural networks built with these kinds of methods, the methods that we're actually seeing uh, show up in state-of-the-art systems, um, be trained to do anything that resembles compositional semantics as linguists might think of it? Um, and in particular, if we take this as an actual goal for engineering research, if we're willing to build new systems and train new models, what do we try to optimize for? What is our sort of uh, task proxy for compositional semantics? And in the, in the sort of preamble to this talk, I'm going to make the case for the task of natural language inference as a sort of ideal research task for work on um, compositional semantics in the context of these end-to-end -end machine learning systems. So what is this task? You'll also hear it called textual, uh, recognizing textual entailment. It's a sentence pair classification task. So in an instance of this task, you're going to give a model two sentences, usually they're at least somewhat related and ask the model to pick from a, a small fixed set of labels the label that best describes the relationship between the meanings of two sentences. So this is an example from Bill McCartney's thesis. Uh, the model will see James Byron Dean refused to move without blue jeans, and James Dean didn't dance without pants, and it would have to judge that this is an instance of an entailment. Uh, if A is true, B must also be true, rather than a contradiction or a sort of neutral example. So <clears throat> why is this interesting? Um, the somewhat hand-wavy claim that I'd like to make is that in typical sort of normal-looking examples uh, of NLI, the kinds of things that you actually see in NLI data sets, um, in order to succeed, a model has to come up with a reasonable account of every major phenomenon that, that we think about when we think about compositional semantics, and to some extent lexical semantics too. So for a model to, to sort of succeed in typical examples, it'll have to deal with lexical entailment. These are things like hypernomy hierarchies and lexical exclusion. You'll have to deal with quantifiers and monotonicity reasoning. You'll have to deal with coreference at several different levels of representation, ambiguity at several different levels of representation. Um, you'll have to bring in some amounts of common sense background knowledge and do at least at least some pragmatic work. You'll have to do with modals. And I would really argue that this list goes on to, to, to include pretty much everything that, that we care about in compositional semantics, with one major exception, uh, which is anything to do with grounding. This is a completely ungrounded task that has the disadvantage that it sort of limits the questions we can ask, but it has the huge advantage that we can use this to study uh, neural network methods that don't really have any analog to grounding available. So why this task in particular? There are other tasks out there that are much more useful. NLI occasionally comes up in real applied NLP problems, but there's not a billion dollar product behind it. Um, in other, in sort of historic work in the last few years of, um, of deep learning for NLP, there have been a bunch of papers that have said we are working on compositional semantics that have used tasks like sentiment analysis and sentence similarity. I think these are viable research tasks, but I think they're not as they're not as demanding as NLI. That, that especially for something like sentiment analysis, if you get um, sentiment keywords right and you get scope right and you get hedging right, you're almost all of the way there. And the marginal benefit you get from dealing with things like belief words is really, really small and very hard to measure. So this is why I prefer NLI to these useful tasks. What about these useful tasks? Uh, there are a bunch of tasks out there that very clearly require thorough language understanding, typical instances, um, and that actually are actually we would like to have models that can do these things for real practical purposes. The trouble is that all of these tasks are are, are um, hard in ways that make it such that the task-specific metrics are measuring things um, other than language understanding ability. Um, this is because for each of these tasks, for a model to succeed, it needs to do good sentence understanding, but it also needs to solve some other difficult open problem that the metric is also measuring. So if you're trying to solve machine translation, you have to solve sentence understanding, but you also have to solve sentence generation, which empirically is at least as hard. And so your, your performance metrics are going to be sort of heavily muddled by these other hard problems. So, so generation, um, so sort of doing information retrieval on large data sources, um, structure prediction, et cetera. And a lot, you really just need to figure out what's going on, do a little bit of inference. You're mostly measuring uh, semantic ability. So um, in the rest of this talk, I'm going to be somewhat foolhardy and try to fit in uh, two talks in the, re the remaining 20-ish minutes. 
So first I'm going to talk about some artificial language experiments that are kind of laying the groundwork for work with neural networks on NLI. This is trying to see if we can, uh, if the sorts of, of methods that we see all over the place in, in um, applied neural networks work are adequate to, to even really kind of get at the, the basic operations we need to do NLI. And then I'll actually start to show some work that we've done uh, on English. And then I'll wrap up with uh, some, some related projects that might be of interest to this audience very quickly. So this first project, um, this was done with my advisors back at Stanford, Chris Potts and Chris Manning. Um, and the question we're trying to answer here is, can standard neural networks with arbitrarily clean and abundant data, if we have all the data we want, learn to perform NLI with perfect precision? So are they sort of fundamentally broken, or can they learn this kind of thing? And the basic paradigm we're going to use is to come up with some sort of uh, formal system that will just give us relational statements. So we, we, we write down a world model, we write down a grammar where we can just generate sentence pairs and we know the labels. Then we'll train a model on a bunch of these pairs and test it on some other such pairs from the same system. Um, the formal systems that we're going to use are based on the natural logic of um, McCartney and of uh, Eichhardt and Moss. This is uh, a reasonably extensive formal semantics that's built with NLI or textual entailment as its kind of um, basic operation. Um, and this, this kind of gives us the machinery that we need to do this. The first experiment I'm going to uh, talk about in this vein is just looking at uh, lexical relations, word-word relations. We're not doing any composition yet, but we're still studying a, an aspect of reasoning that turns out to be quite important in textual entailment, which is kind of inferring some relations from other relations. The idea here is that we'll train a model one by one on a bunch of word pairs. So we'll train it to, to recognize that dance entails move, tango entails dance, sleep, and sleep contradicts dance, waltz and tails dance, and then we'll give it a, a test pair where it's seen the words before but it hasn't seen the pair together. And we're hoping that, that just in the process of having memorized all of this, the model will have kind of learned a bit of structure to the universe that it could use to, to, to fill in this blank. That it might recognize that, okay, uh, you can't be sleeping and dancing at the same time, but if you're waltzing, you're dancing, so um, sleep must contradict waltz. We're not giving it the logical rules that we need to make this deduction. We're hoping we'll just pick it up in the process of memorizing these word pairs. Um, we're using the seven-way formulation of entailment rather than the three-way one um, that, I, that I showed you in that example. This is just sort of the, what, the bread and butter of this uh, McCartney natural logic formalism, but the same idea holds. So here's what our data actually look like. These are, these are meaningless fake words with the seven-way uh, seven entailment distinction. The model we're using is meant to just be the simplest thing we could come up with that we can throw at this problem. Um, to classify a pair of words, you look up two word embeddings from, from uh, a single trained word embedding matrix. You feed those into a comparison layer, H. This is a trained single neural network layer function that's just meant to pull out a feature vector representing the pair of words. And then that goes into uh, a softmax or logistic regression classifier on top. It's all trained directly. And it works. Um, relatively small, relatively small universe, we were able to use relatively small models. Um, if we use a bilinear composition function, this gets us multiplicative interaction between the two inputs. This is not maybe the standard thing, but something you do see in typical neural network methods. The model will fluctuate near, near perfect accuracy. Um, if you sort of pull the model when it's doing perfectly on the development set, it'll tend to be near ceiling on the test set. So there it completely works. If you use just a sing single completely standard TANH neural network layer to do this comparison, the model isn't perfect, but the mistakes it makes seem to be fairly random. The model does basically seem to be picking up on, on most of the reasoning work that it needs to do to solve the problem, and will get accuracies around 93, 4, 5%. And this, this means the models learn something very non-trivial. The logical rules that, that the model would need in order to make these inferences perfectly take up many, many, many pages of equations. I think there are something like uh, sort of 45 logical statements the model would need to know in order to get accuracies like this, and it's picking them up entirely in the process of memorizing data with standard tools. Cool. So can these models um, walk and chew gum at the same time? What if we ask them to learn to do this and simultaneously learn to um, build compositional sentence representations? So to test this, we are going to enrich our um, formerly completely trivial formal language with conjunction, disjunction, and negation with our usual semantics. Uh, we now have a language that's, that's recursive, which is nice. And we're going to add on this extra twist, which is that we'll train the model on statements of, of up to a fixed complexity, statements with no more than six logical uh, conjunctions or disjunctions in them, and tests on statements that, that go a little bit longer. Um, 
The model now needs to be a bit more complex because we're dealing with uh, input sequences or inputs of structures instead of just input symbols. And so the, the first thing that we tried, this was more or less standard at the time we were doing this a few years ago, is a, a, a tree structured RNA, a tree LTM. So here we have this model that, that recursively applies a neural network composition function over a binary tree, and this is meant to be the binary sort of constituency tree for the sentence, to get a vector at the top representing the sentence using the vectors of the words. We do that to each of our two input sentences, and then everything above this point is the same. This is just sort of minimal trivial neural network for doing sentence comparison. Um, as an alternative to the tree structured component for representing sentences, we also want to try a standard sequential neural, net neural network. Uh, in, a, in, in practical applications, these have really won out, and this is what you see much more often in models for things like translation. <coughs> so here the model just reads the words from left to right instead of according to any kind of hierarchy. Uh, our language has a ton of syntactic ambiguity, so we actually give the model the, the constituency information that it needs by just giving it parentheses in the sequence. So here are some results. Um, this, the vertical axis is accuracy on unseen test data. Um, this is the number of logical connectives in the expression <coughs> that we're testing on. And so if you look at this red line, if we just guess randomly, you do terribly, you, you get around half of the examples right. Our sequence-based, LSTM-based model here um, does okay. On the very short examples, it hovers near ceiling. It really did learn the relevant generalization. But its performance decays reasonably quickly um, as these expressions get longer. And it's not, it's not able to do all that well in these expressions that are longer than anything that it's seen at training time. These expressions past this, this dotted line of, of six connectives. Um, but it still was able to learn something. It still is able to sort of take advantage of the recursive grammar in this language. It's still doing way better than chance, even on these examples that are longer than anything it's seen. The tree LSTM does, I think, as well as we could reasonably expect anything to do here. It's very close to ceiling on the examples that it's seen, and it does lose performance as these expressions get longer. There are fundamental reasons that neural network models have to do this in this kind of setting. Um, but it loses performance fairly slowly. And this drop off as we cross this line into sentences that are longer than anything we've seen before is almost non existent. So, again, this seems to work. Again, the building blocks that we've been using uh, might not be the best things for this kind of task, but they do seem sort of fundamentally usable for, the, for uh, NLI and for compositional semantics. Cool. So, let's actually do some work on English. Um, I'll be talking about two projects kind of centered around data collection, because um, this is the angle that I've been coming at this from. Some of this is joint work with Gabor Angeli and my advisor at Stanford. Some of this is work with Adina Williams and Nikita Nambia at NYU. So um, the first half of this is, is I'll just be talking about the introduction of the Stanford NLI corpus. Um, this is a data set we put together um, a little over two years ago. Um, no, a little over three years ago now. Um, this was the first reasonably large um, human labeled data set for the NLI task. Up until this point, we had some data sets that were were sort of nice, clean pairs of sentences labeled by humans. We had some large data sets that were generated heuristically. And it turned out that, that putting these two things together was not enough to get anything to work. There was, there was work from several labs on this problem, but no one was able to really do NLI with end-to-end -end training. So we um, got a grant and threw it all into Mechanical Turk and, um, and collected a much larger data set in the style of what was already out there. <coughs> Here's how we collected it. Um, we got together um, a bunch of anonymous English speakers on the internet and about 200,000 times showed them this screen. Here's the prompt. We will show you the caption for a photo. We will not show you the photo using only the caption and what you know about the world. Write one alternate caption that is definitely a true description of the photo. Write one that might be a true description of the photo. And write one that is definitely a false description of the photo. We'll then give them a real image caption. This is. <coughs> This is a, a, some, another MTurk worker's description of a real photo. Um, we throw out the photo, and we ask them to fill in these three text boxes, which correspond to our three questions. And with each one of these, we get a sentence pair. This sentence is entailed by this blue sentence. This one is neutral <coughs> with respect to the blue sentence. And this one is contradiction, uh, a contradiction with respect to the blue sentence. And using these photo captions makes everything very concrete, makes this a very easy task for the annotators to learn. Here are some random samples from our dev set. This is what this, this corpus mostly looks like. Two women are embracing while holding to-go packages. Two women are holding packages. Entailment. Maybe not that exciting, but it's valid. A man selling donuts to a customer during a world exhibition event held in the city of Angeles. A woman drinks her coffee in a small cafe. Contradiction. This is not necessarily the common sense, a sort of con contradiction in the common sense, sense of the term, but this is exactly what we want. 
a contradiction, uh, something is a contradiction in the NLI sense if the two sentences can't describe the same event or the same situation. So these could both be true. They could both be true of events taking place at a similar place in time, um, but they can't both be describing the same event with the same agent, uh, the same participants. So, cool. Um, how well do neural networks do on this task that we set up? Uh, first, some baselines. Uh, if we just guess, you get about a third of the examples right. We did some filtering and cleanup, but it's still roughly a third, a third, a third balanced classification. Um, if we throw a big leftwise classifier at this, this is meant to be sort of the, the, um, the strongest model we could put together without any end-to-end -end learning and without any particularly powerful um, logical machinery, we're able to get up to about 80%. This is logistic regression with about um, 100 million features. So this is not a trivial model. Let's try some neural networks. Um, a uh, deep bag of words model, uh, something where we, we add up a bunch, of, um, a bunch of glove embeddings, as you saw uh, this morning, or a bunch of roughly equivalent word, word to back embeddings, and then um, feed those through a, a simple neural network. That gets you around 81% uh, accuracy. Switching to um, a bidirectional uh, sequential model, uh, like an LSTM, gets up to 81-82% accuracy. Um, I don't have the result here, but if you, if you glue trees on top of that, you get another, uh, another percent or so in gain. Um, this data set's been out for now, I guess, three years. Um, and in that time, we've, we've, had, um, we've had a bunch of people pick this up. I'm very excited. We've had um, maybe a couple hundred papers that have used this data in some way. And looking at sort of the best results we've seen out of that, um, the best results from a model that, that has a sort of clear composition function that reads a sentence and um, builds it into a single vector representation of the sentence meaning gets about 86% accuracy. This is with some internal attention mechanisms. The best result overall is with this big hybrid neural network that uses uh, tree structured models and sequential models and attention to do alignment across the two um, and gets up to about 89%. So I think SNLI was useful in sort of kicking off neural network work on this problem, but it has some fairly serious limitations. As a, a practical issue for the community, it doesn't have a lot of header. Uh, the best, uh, best system out there gets around 89% accuracy. Human performance is in the mid 90s. And I think a lot of that remaining difficulty involves kind of pragmatic or common sense work that's going to be very hard to model with the sorts of tools we have. So we'd like to have a little more room for further work on the semantics. Also, SNLI was, was very much a bait and switch. Um, I, I motivated NLI by saying we can really look at all of these phenomena we see in compositional semantics, and then I collected a data set that's centered on these concrete visual scenes. And concrete visual scenes allow you to ignore a lot of fun things we'd like to deal with, like tense and beliefs and modalities. We want to put together a data set that really does cover everything we'd like it to cover. Uh, so we put together another corpus, went back to the Cannibal Turk, uh, roughly the same data collection procedure, roughly the same size, fewer sentences, but they're a bit longer. But now, instead of just using these photo captions, we use documents, uh, we use sentences from a bunch of different sources within the Open American National Corpus um, that are meant to really kind of cover roughly the, the full range of things that we'd expect a typical user of American English to be able to understand. So we've got uh, written language and spoken language with, uh, with telephone speech. We've got uh, very formal government publications. We've got uh, wacky fan fiction. We've got travel guides. Um, and, and the goal is for this to be relatively representative. And to actually test this claim that it is fairly representative of kind of the full diversity, we found five more, um, five more sources of language and collected more data for those and just included that in the development of test sets. So the hope is that if a model really is kind of getting a decent understanding of English as a whole, it should be able to do well, not just on this data, but also on this data. Uh, for example, generalizing from telephone speech to face-to-face -to -face speech uh, or to letters. Here's what this data looks like. In contrast, suppliers that have continued to innovate and expand their use of the four practices, as well as other activities described in previous chapters, keep outperforming the industry as a whole. The suppliers that continue to innovate in their use of the four practices continue uh, consistently underperform the industry. Contradiction. This is pretty straightforward, but it requires you to understand a reasonably richly structured sentence to, to know what's going on. Someone else noticed it, and I said, well, I guess that's true, and it was somewhat melodious. In other words, it wasn't just you know, it, it was really funny. If, if, if you haven't dealt with switch with switchboard for uh, telephone speech, it's very hard to chunk into anything that remotely resembles a sentence. <laughs> but our annotators nonetheless understood what was going on here and gave us consistent labels. Uh, no one noticed, and it wasn't funny at all. Contradiction seemed reasonable. To me. So some key results for this uh, for this new data set. Um, our inner annotator agreement measures uh, were the same for SNLI and multi-NLI. They were within half a percent, no matter how we were measuring it. 
Um, so for humans, this data is no more, no more difficult to solve. Uh, multi null is not particularly hard for humans. But if we took the state of the art neural network models that it proposed for SNLI, retrained them and, and retested them on this new data, their performance plummeted by, um, by in most cases, around 15 percentage points. This is a much harder data set uh, for these machine learning models. It does present a real uh, unsolved open problem for sort of semantics and neural networks. And very reassuringly, we, we found sort of simple automatic ways to look for the presence of a lot of these phenomena we're interested in, and they're there. Um, modals are a nice example. This goes from basically being absent in SNLI to showing up a little under a third of the time in uh, multi-NLI. Uh, negation shows up six times more often. WH terms show up far more often. Belief terms go from absent to reasonably common. So this does actually get you, force you to deal with a whole bunch of interesting phenomena. So we wrap up on NLI. <clears throat> this task lets you judge the, the degree to which your models are capable of learning to understand natural language sentences, or at least so I claim. Um, looking at artificial data lets us see that the kinds of neural network building blocks we're using aren't, aren't hopeless. They, they, are, uh, they are at least roughly capable of doing the kinds of things we'd like them to do. With SNLI, we're able to see that, that this, these results do generalize reasonably well to actual um, English data. And with multi-NLI, we're able to test the ability of these models to actually cover uh, a reasonably diverse swath of American English. Do neural networks understand language yet? At least judging by results on, um, on multi NLI, they're doing OK, but no. Uh, let me very quickly uh, kind of throw out pointers to a couple of other projects that I think are relevant to this workshop that I couldn't fit in. Um, I've uh, been doing some work with uh, Dina Williams and Andrew Drozdov on this problem of latent tree learning. Um, the idea here is we have these tree structured neural networks that I alluded to that use some kind of constituency parts to guide the interpretations of sentences. What if we train these models, but we don't give them the tree structures and ask them to instead find the optimal constituency tree structures for the objective of doing sentence understanding, of doing NLI? Um, this is something we've, we've worked on. This is something where actually there have been great, great results out of uh, Chris Dyer's group and out of another group in, in Korea. Um, these things are able to learn to solve these problems really well. We were hoping to look at them and see, ooh, they're learning some very exciting grammar. Um, it turns out these models aren't yet learning anything particularly interesting or particularly systematic. These models don't tend to actually um, pay attention to the lexical contents of sentences when they parse them. They usually just find a parsing strategy that works well for, for most things and we're using that. So this is a, a very hard open problem we're working on. We have a manuscript with some early results up that, that um, will hopefully be appearing in, in Tackle for too long. There's also a paper that, that, um, that Alex Forstadt uh, presented this morning at the LSA and that should be out in paper form in a couple of months um, on this problem of acceptability judgments. So um, the question here is can we, use, um, can we use these artificial neural network methods with um, mostly unlabeled data with no prior knowledge of language and get them to, to produce the kinds of data that work in formal, in especially formal syntax uh, is sort of typically built to analyze. Um, we, we definitely can't produce human level acceptability judgments, but we've gotten some very interesting results out of that. Um, ask us if you're curious. And with that, thanks. Just, just a couple quick announcements. Um, please say your name and affiliation before you ask your question. Um, I'm, I'm filming this, and I'll be distributing it. If you want to make sure that you get it, get, get on the skill mailing list, Society for Computation and Linguistics. You'll go to our blog site and you'll see there's a mailing list that you can get on and you'll find out about the filming. And if you asked a question in the last session and I don't know you, um, please tell me your name so I'll be, be able to attribute your, your question to you, for example. Thank you. Emily? All right, so we have five minutes for questions. Now that you know you're being filmed, you don't want to ask questions. <laughs> uh, Nathan Schneider, Georgetown. Um, so a, a data question. Um, mm -hmm. I'm really excited to hear about multi-NLI uh, and how it covers more genres. Uh, do you think there might be artifacts um, due to the way it was produced that somehow make the language a little bit less natural than sentences that were spontaneously produced? And I'm thinking especially of the work on translation means, where uh, you know there, there have been consistent patterns shown that are characteristic of translations that are not characteristic of you know, naturalistic speech. Yeah, so I have, I have a couple of answers to that. And, and yes, there are, this is the, uh, the sentences that we collected in the process of data collection 
um, aren't exactly natural English um, in a couple of ways. So um, one thing just, yes, I, I think probably people were, were responding to this, this Mechanical Turk task in ways that they, they wouldn't, and writing in ways they wouldn't necessarily write otherwise. I don't think that is that big of a problem because for a model to solve this task, it has to understand the user written sentences, but it also has to understand these sentences that are coming from outside sources, like these Berlitz travel guides, Slate magazine, switchboard calls. So the, the same model has to be able to understand both sources. The, the other artifact, which, which is, a, is a real issue, um, is that when people are writing contradiction sentences and writing entailment sentences, they do actually use somewhat different strategies. So um, if a model gets to read the second sentence without reading the first, it can't do nearly as well if it's doing the full task, but it does better than chance. We're seeing accuracies around maybe 50% on something like multi line. So there, there are some artifacts. And I think actually for, for at least the first issue, there's kind of a no free lunch theorem that, that I, I'm, I'm not sure there's any way to get someone to write completely naturalistic English um, in the context of data collection for NLI. And it's very, very hard to build an NLI data set using entirely naturally occurring text because it's very hard without using a machine learning model that's, that are gonna, that's gonna bias your results to pick pairs of sentences in the wild that are likely to be related in an interesting way. Uh, all was first by a quarter second. Uh, okay, so the, yeah, Tom and then uh, Tom Tom. So you have a sense of what are the difficult phenomena uh, for language understanding right now? What if there are specific classes of the phenomena that fails on more often than others? Um, there are tables I could refer to that I don't have handy. I think the um, far and away the far and away the most serious problem is unfortunately the one that I, I sort of declared was was out of the scope of, of anything I hope to do, um, which is sort of common sense background knowledge. Is, is some of is a, a decent minority of uh, data and data sets like this um, require you to draw on additional premises that aren't included in the text. Things like um, elephants are featured in circuses. Um, and it's, we, we don't have any particularly good ideas for how to teach typical neural network models to use that kind of information. Um, beyond that, it's kind of the usual suspects. We're pretty good at negation, but it's definitely not solved. We're pretty good at monotonicity with quantifiers, but it's definitely not solved. Belief is tricky. That's all I can say off the top of my head. Um, Christine, you, you mess. So um, one thing I was wondering was, so um, I work on speech and prosody, and um, there's been a lot of stuff on pragmatics and prosody, but not as much on semantics and you know true uh, conditional semantics and the kinds of things that you're interested in. And so what I was wondering was, would an extension of the you know kind of your research program or, or something like to go uh, starting from spoken language help us reveal anything about, you know, prosody and semantics in, the, in what you're interested in? Um, that's, a, that's a good question. I'm, I'm very interested in these methods that have been used for text alone, so it's, it's really something where I, I imagine you've thought about this, a lot of the issues more than I have. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I expect that, I expect that te the textual entailment paradigm will be useful for studying sort of speech specific aspects of the communication of meaning of semantics um, in the same ways that it's useful for understanding the parts of semantics you can represent easily in text. We are at time, but remember that there's more time for discussion with these authors um, from the, in the second slot after lunch. Yeah, two o'clock, two to three, please come back.